Jessica. And I'm David, and this is Passports and Birth Control, a couple's take on international travel. Now this trip was my first big trip abroad. We spent two and a half months, 90 days, walking around Europe, and this was a trip we planned really for the entire first year of our marriage. It's something we'd always wanted to do, it's something we talked about, we really we dreamed about. We really met over our shared desire to travel internationally. Right, and so this dream, or rather this trip, was a dream come true for us. So we're going to spend this amazing 90 days in Europe, and we're going to break that down for you one city at a time. Yeah, the reason we talked about in the previous episodes where we said, look, this Kiev episode was out of order, this Turkey episode was out of order, this is that trip, and we're going to recreate that trip for you in order. Now part of that is going to be the travel we took between cities. So we start this trip with an international flight. Now most of you, if you're going to go internationally, if you're an American and you're going to Europe, you're most likely going to take an airplane. Right. So we obviously did that. We took a jet aircraft uh, from our hometown to, uh, we ended up going through Charlotte, North Charlotte, Carolina, mm -hmm. which has a lot of international routes to, to Europe that are quite affordable. And then direct from Charlotte to Dublin. The problem with the flight to Dublin from Charlotte, from the East Coast, however, is it's only a six-hour flight. And so it didn't really give you time to acclimate for the jet lag. Hard to sleep on a plane anyways, but you've only got six hours. Maybe if it's a 15-hour flight to China, you can you can uh, get some, some time in there to sleep so and relax. So melatonin on the plane is your friend. So if you can sleep on the six-hour flight or seven- or eight-hour flight, it'd be better if we could fly out of Chicago, maybe add a couple hours onto that trip just to give you some breathing room. But we ended up leaving in the evening and arriving early in the morning. <sighs> it was not the best situation, but we managed it. Right, so we're, we're there, it's like 9 a.m., and what's surprising is Dublin is an interesting city. So the first thing we see is, is the, the customs agent. Just from the beginning, you go through the customs agent, and they're just pleasant. Friendly as can be. And they get this nice, pretty green stamp on your passport. Bright Kelly green. Right from the beginning, you're like, oh my gosh, this is this so is Ireland. This is so delightful. And we get the cab driver was a fantastic fellow. He told us all about the trip he was planning to take so to Spain. So many stories. It made me think, oh my gosh, what, what a wonderful society this is where a regular laborer can plan a trip to Spain and all this thing. Like, like it, it, it was just interesting. I mean, I think in the United States, we're, we're unfortunately too used to uh, people of certain professions, cab drivers, bus drivers, whatever. Like, you can't take vacations. You don't make nearly enough money. Right. This is a society that seems to take care of its people, and, and it was really a good takeaway to say, oh, my gosh, if we take care of everybody, maybe they're more pleasant. <laughs> you know, so, maybe it's the good social welfare programs. Maybe it's just the culture, but we have... We never really found an unpleasant Irish person oh, no. the entire time we we're there, and, and, and I'm sure that they exist. Oh, I'm sure they do, but they didn't show themselves to us. <laughs> right. So it was a, a, right from the beginning a very pleasant experience. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is we stayed at a hotel that was kind of like an in-hotel thing. It wasn't really a hostel. It, it was, was a, still very affordable. Right. We, we booked it uh, through through Hostel World, which I recommend you do that. We did that throughout a lot of this trip. Oh, 90% of our hotels Hostelworld.com. Hostel. It's a great place. You can do Airbnbs. You can do other hotel booking areas. But hostels are a fantastic use. Now, we kind of made a mistake here because we thought we're jet lagged. We're going to get a nicer place. And, well, we took a gamble on a place that we thought was nicer and... Honestly, it might have been better to take a hostel. It might have been. But the thing about Dublin hostels is they're pretty ubiquitous. They're in old apartment blocks throughout Dublin, and they're pretty interchangeable, and they're all very affordable. Just find a place that, that you deem to be within walking distance to everything, which isn't very hard because it's a very walkable city. Very walkable. So we're there. We get our book bags checked in. And we're walking around. We're like, okay, the first thing we want is we want a nice, hearty meal. And a Guinness. Yes, because you arrive in Dublin, you want a Guinness. Right, so we go to this restaurant that's a bit of a walk to the Temple Bar District, which I'll get to that in a second. But we go to this place called the Ald Dubliner, spelled A-U-L-D. Highly recommend. Very fantastic place. It's got some good food, but also at, at, in the evening it becomes a nice music and, and, uh, and drinking venue. It's a fantastic place. And we go there and we, we look on the menu and there's an item there I'd never seen before. Now, I don't know Irish food all that well. I grew up uh, not eating that many Irish foods, but mm -hmm. since marrying an Irish woman, 
I, Irish heritage. Irish heritage woman. Uh, I have since learned many more Irish dishes, one of which was coddle. So Dublin coddle, as it was called, is... Do you want to describe this dish? What it? Well, it's sort of a, almost a stew. It's the sort of meal you put on at the beginning of the day, you let it simmer all day, and then you've got a nice, hearty, not healthy, but delicious meal to come home to. It's made with bangers, an Irish sausage, typically made with pork. It's made with rashers, which is European bacon, thicker, a, not really leaner, just cut a little differently. Then it has, of course, potatoes and carrots. And that's really about it. It's, it has a broth of cider or beer, hard cider or beer, and broth, and it's this wonderful, hearty, deeply rich dish. That kind of describes a lot of traditional Irish food. Right. The hearty, deep, and rich. But I think the key characteristic is, like you said, leaving it sitting at and simmering all day, yes. and letting all those wonderful juices marinate, which was heaven to us after being so jet lined. So I or so I never had coddle before. I didn't never really, heard of it. Never heard of it before. So our server comes by, very friendly Irish gentleman. Of course. And, and I say, uh, is the Dublin coddle good? And he says to me, Oh, it's not as good as me mum's. So of course he orders it. <laughs> it's not as good as me mum's, but it's good. So I'm like, that is the most delightful criticism of your own food. It's oh it's not as good as me mum's, but it's good. And so, of course, I have it. I have no idea if it was actually better or worse than that, that gentleman's mother, but I thoroughly enjoyed it, especially paired with a Guinness. It inspired me to start making it. All right, so it's since been on, uh, on our dinner tables uh, very, uh, very often. Yes. So, of course, as David mentioned, the Old Dubliner is in Temple Bar. Now, Temple Bar is almost a touristy area of Dublin, but it's also very old and traditional part of Dublin, and it's something you really cannot miss. Now, it's called Temple Bar because back when, when the streets are muddy, before they were really paved, there was a bar, a raised platform on which you would walk that would get you out of the mud. And it was a place where laborers and what have you would meet, they'd have lunch, they'd have a pint, and they'd go about their day. So it naturally evolved from that. This is a place right. that people have been eating and drinking and doing and playing music for a long time in Dublin's history. And it just was a natural place where lots of bars and restaurants. You could compare it to Bourbon Street, Beale Street, but... Yes, not quite as rowdy. Yeah, well, not nearly as rowdy as Bourbon Street, that's for sure. Fair enough. And I think in a lot of ways people look down upon Bourbon Street because it's too touristy and, and the locals don't really like it. That's this, not true of Temple Bar. This is nothing like that at all. One of the things we discovered when we are in Ireland is th there are so many cliches that were delightfully true. You'd have a tourist on your left and a local on your right. And they're all nice and friendly. And, and, and so it's, 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 you, you end up being in a place that feels authentic and yet welcoming. And it, 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 it just feels different than you expect but still so wonderful it does not feel like a tourist trap absolutely not. it is a place that you that everyone including locals enjoy going now more of a tourist thing but i suppose it's a, it's a part of uh, ireland's national heritage absolutely is on in trinity college uh, in dublin once we'd of course taken a nap after our, our yes. little dublin coddle experience uh, we went to Trinity College to see the Book of Kells. Now, the Book of Kells is an illustrated manuscript. It's the oldest Bible that uh, that exists in Ireland. And it was very, very ancient, uh, but also extremely beautiful. Extremely beautiful. And there's a museum where you can see it. It's a weird thing to go to a museum just to see a book, but it's totally worth it. You see this, you get to see how the, the monks uh, illustrated the, the manuscript, but also there's a little bit of Ir of Dublin's history mm -hmm. going back to when Vikings were there, when these monks came over, and when Ireland adopted Catholic Christianity. So you see a little bit of the brief history of Dublin and Ireland as you get to see all these great pieces of art. But on top of that, something that's really great is at the end of the tour, after you've seen the book, you get to see two additional things as you're leaving the building where the book is stored. You get to see the oldest Irish harp in Ireland, and it's the it's it's if you see, look at Guinness, if you see this Irish harp on a bottle of Guinness, this is the harp 
that the Guinness logo is modeled after, that the, the nation of Ireland uses as its national symbol, it's this, th this harp is in this museum. So you get to see this and ancient harp. it's far harp. bigger than you would think. It's huge. It's a, what's well, a as, full... As tall as, tall as I right, am. Right, it's not like a lyre. It's a small, not a handhold thing. It's a tall harp. In addition to that, as you're exiting, you exit through the Trinity College Library, which is the long phenomenal. Room. The long room. It's like an overturned... Uh, wooden vessel. I mean, it Absolutely is... Absolutely beautiful. It's like you walk into Hogwarts, but it's made out of wood, and, and it's, it's all these books everywhere. It is magical. Ancient illustrated manuscripts. You just want to get lost in there and, and find a table and just find an old tome. And just page through it, even though you don't know the language. It's just that beautiful. Now, part of Ireland's cultural heritage, we also went to Christ Church and St. Patrick's Cathedral. These are both very old, active churches. Again, a place of active worship, so as always, be respectful. Lots of history there. There's other uh, additional museum-type uh, exhibits on display at Christ Church and at uh, St. Patrick's, but these are the biggest cathedrals uh, in, in Dublin, and they're just unmistakable. You know, just the beautiful stone flying buttresses. And, of course, everywhere in the architecture, you see the Trinity Knot. The three-cornered knot that you see in almost all Irish motifs. Yeah, it's it's this the three rings together. Yes, you see uh, variations of it, and it, it's it's a it's a wonderful uh, thematic piece of art that you see in uh, lots of places all throughout Dublin. Oh yes. So, one of the things that uh, we, we we had to take care of, of, of logistically in this trip is we wanted to make sure we had a European cell phone to use. Because again, we were there for two and a half months. We wanted to make sure we could contact our hostels or our hotels in case there was a problem or we a had, flight delay. We had booked a few Airbnbs, so we needed to make sure we had a phone. And of course, being without a phone feels a little bit like you're naked, so we had right. to make sure that we had phone use. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can do what we did, which is buy a real cheap phone, like a flip phone or something. You don't have to be a smartphone. And uh, get a short SIM card of some kind with a, a handful of minutes on it or, or, or whatever you need. Or you can get an international plan from any cell phone provider. That, however, is exceedingly expensive. And so we chose the more economical option of buying the, for lack of a better term, burner phone. Right. And what you can do is what we discovered is you can pause your, your cell phone plan. So we paused our cell phone plan for the three months we were going to be away. And we kept our phones because what the, what we realized is when you keep your smartphone on airplane mode, the GPS and Wi-Fi still works. And you can use it as a camera. You can use it to, as we did, keep in touch with your family via Facebook or whatever you happen to use. You can check your email, but more importantly, you could get your maps on your smartphone. Yes. So you were not without a map. And Google Translate. And to Google Translate. So we had our smartphones for all those traveling needs, and we had a you know, a SIM card phone right. to use for calling in case we needed to get in touch with an Airbnb host or make an emergency phone call. Now, we did need to get one of these phones while we were there. So we started hunting for an electronics store. Yeah, so we went to an electronics store, and, and there's this uh, street in Dublin with a lot of different electronics. They're pretty easy to find. Uh, but we went to this electronics store, and we asked the, uh, the gentleman um, who was selling uh, cell phones right. if he also sold SIM cards. Now, it turns out the place where you buy a cell phone is not the place where you get a SIM card. And so I said, well, where do we get a SIM card? And he said, oh, you go to the tree store. Of course, I immediately knew what this gentleman was trying to communicate uh, hold on, to Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. A tree store, like, like a Home Depot? You want me to go to a Home Depot and get a SIM card? Said, no, the tree store. Said, what? They sell trees David, and SIM David, cards? No. Said, no, the tree store. And so at this point, the gentleman and I both hold up three fingers and go, I go, David. The three store. There happens to be an electronic store that sells cell phone paraphernalia in Europe and in Dublin that is called the Three Store. And the Anglo Saxon that I am. I do not understand the Irish <laughs> accent. Go to yeah, the Tree Store. Go to the Tree Store. <laughs> the Tree Store. I couldn't, he couldn't wrap my head around that there's a place that sells trees. And meanwhile, and I'm <laughs> laughing at him because I know exactly what this gentleman is trying to communicate. So they had a good laugh at my expense. We went to the tree store and we got our SIM card. Okay. So we also went to the Guinness Brewery. Now, of course, you can't miss the Guinness Brewery when you are in Dublin. This is absolutely part of, well, 
Dublin's heritage. It's been around since 1790s, I believe. It's been around for a very long time, and, and it's 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 continues to be one of the top selling beers in the world. But always best on draft, not in bottle. So going back to the old Dubliner, we actually learned why Guinness actually does taste better in Dublin. And I asked the the, the, the server who told me about the Dublin Cottle. I said, "Why is Guinness better in Dublin?" He said, "Well." Forgive me the butchering this accent, but he's he, I'm not going to even attempt it. He said, uh, your Guinness has to go on a boat across the ocean, or it's brewed in the States, and, and so it's, 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 it's not as happy as my beer, which comes from just down the street. Now, the fascinating thing about Guinness is the water. The water is really key to Guinness, and Guinness, no matter where in the world it is brewed, the water is adjusted to be chemically identical in terms of pH and mineral composition to that of the original Guinness Brewery. Right, so they match and recreate it, but I guess it's not as happy unless it's brewed in Dublin. Well, it's just not the same. <laughs> so what? before we get to the brewery and, and a few of the details there, we actually wanted to get lunch before we went to the brewery, so we stopped. I never drink on an empty stomach. Never drink on an empty stomach. So we're wandering through the the, the, the streets near Guinness Factory, and, and it, it's relatively underdeveloped. There's low buildings and not a lot of, it, it's it's not really in the downtown area. Very much a local area. And so we're looking for a lunch place. We want to avoid all the Italian places, the, the Indian places. We're like, no, we want just like a local's place. We find, like... A magic artifact some sandwich board that says uh, soup and sandwiches and it had a price tag on it so we're like okay well we'll just go in here and get some soup sandwiches we walk in it's like a diner it's got green vinyl booths and a bunch of families in it and a couple old old gentlemen in suits and vests sitting and in the front and the hats sitting in the front and we walk in and immediately the bartender leans over and and, uh, and he says we don't have menus and uh, like, you're not really you don't from around here. here, are you? It was, it was very weird. It's like the whole place, everyone shut, you know, stop. I think I heard a, a fork drop back. <laughs> so, so so they're they're all quiet, and, they, and uh, they say, we don't have menus. And I said, well, can we have the soup and sandwich that the sandwich board advertised? They said, oh, okay, sit down. So And then everybody goes back to normal. They're fine. It's like, okay, well, we're not going to be one of those problem tourists. We're just right. going to sit. We're going to have our soup. We're going to have our sandwich. So we sit down, and he brings us this delightful tomato soup and a ham, onion, and cheese sandwich. Extremely simple, but... Delicious. Delicious. Clearly, and it had been simmering for hours. Right, and, and we had that with a, with, a, with a lager, and it felt like, okay, we're, we're going to enjoy this brief lunch, and then we're going to go to the Guinness Brewery. While we're sitting there eating, one of those families I described was going to the bar to pay. And this lady had a stroller and a bunch of kids as well and a bunch of other people with her. And on her stroller, on the back handles, she had precariously balanced a bunch of shopping bags. And so she stops this stroller with a baby in it, and the old gentleman with the hat and the vest uh, leans over and, I guess, tickles the chin, tickles, baby's chin. tickles the baby's chin, mm -hmm. and the stroller keels over backwards. It was in no way this gentleman's fault. It was entirely the fault of the bags and the stroller being unattended. But the woman whose baby is now screaming its head off oy, oy. and and upended. I mean, if you're a baby and you all of a sudden you go your your stroller it's flips over, it's frightening. It's it's not harmed or anything though, but it's screaming its head off. And the woman is about to rip this man's head off. Right. When the second elderly gentleman that I told writes you about, the stroller. He writes the stroller, looks the baby in the eye, and says. Oh, don't be crying now. He stops crying immediately. It was the most precious moment. Everything's well. The woman <laughs> does not tear into the first man. It was almost like he had shamed the baby. And the mother. And the mother. Like, oh, there's nothing. There's nothing to be crying about. Like, hey, remember, you're an Irish. You're an Irishman. You may be a baby, but you're an Irishman. Don't be crying. And, and, and it was like... All is Still forgiven. The entire moment over. Everyone was fine, and now the first old man was like crying. He's like he leaned over to us. He said, "I didn't mean to. I didn't do anything." We said, "Yeah, you're no, fine. I'm done. No, no I'm, done. I'm done." We paid our bill, and it was just a magical experience. Right after this wonderful lunch and this delightful little encounter, we went on to the brewery, and there we learned how to properly drink a Guinness. Mm -hmm. Now I would like to demonstrate this for you. I can't. <laughs> so you take your pint of Guinness, you bring it up. As you bring it to your mouth to drink, 
You inhale through your nose to get that nice deep aroma. And then you take your drink, you swallow, and then you exhale. And right. that brings out this refreshing And it does actually enhance the flavor and how your mouth processes it, the flavors of the Guinness. Right, so you get the, the, the aroma of the beer as you're drinking it, and then you exhale and you just get that full flavorful experience. You could probably use this method for any beer, but we learned this at the Guinness, Guinness Brewery and they told us this is the proper way to drink a Guinness. And it is worth doing, even though you might look a little silly. Right, and on the top of the Guinness uh, Brewery, they have a very delightful bar. Uh, definitely go there. Full of all these vintage Guinness advertisements. It's a, just a delightful experience and it's, it can't be missed. Another thing that uh, could be on your priority list, I said the Guinness is, uh, this brewery is a little bit higher, but you can also go to the Jameson Distillery. Jameson is the most popular widely distributed Irish whiskey. It's not the oldest Irish whiskey, uh, but it is the most popular, most common. You see it everywhere. And so Jameson has a distillery in Dublin. It's not an active distillery anymore. It's actually distilled somewhere else. But this is the old distillery where they used to distill. And it's now a museum to the brand. And you get to experience all the different uh, whiskeys that they have there. You take the tour. They give you a free drink at the end of it. So that's fun. Uh, and so true of Guinness. <laughs> yeah. And so you might want to split these two different things. We did this on two, two different days. Guinness Brewery one day. Jimmy missed in the distillery in a different day. Now, Ireland is in the North Atlantic. Cold North Atlantic waters makes for some of the best oysters you can get. And so you cannot miss oysters in Dublin. I highly recommend you go traditional and pair them with a Guinness. Right. So there's a handful of places you can get them on Temple Bar, which is where we ended up going to. Right. You can venture further into the city and find some other places. But the oysters themselves are just hearty and delicious. Thick and meaty. So, and and all, all you need is oysters and a bit of brown bread and a Guinness. And that's a wonderful dinner. Of course, be careful because you know what they say about oysters. Yes, and so that's why we were very happy we had a private uh, room uh, in, in Dublin. So one of the things we discovered is as you're hostel hopping, you can do a private room or you can do a group room. The group room obviously has lower rates. But it might be a little bit more awkward if you're sharing that with another couple. Uh, you can get a private room at a hostel for extremely affordable rates. And these are all things you can filter and search on hostelworld.com. You're probably not going to get your own bathroom. You're probably not going to get a television. It's not a holiday inn. But you're going to get a bed. You're going to get a door and that a you can shower. lock. And, and, and you can, well, it might be a communal shower that you have to use. Uh, but you can use that shower. Now, aside from these wonderful North Atlantic oysters, Dublin is a port city, so you are going to get amazing seafood while you're there. So enjoy the fish and the chips, of course, fish and chips. But the food scene in, in Dublin, in Ireland, is very rich, very hearty, very much comfort food. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you want to take in all those rich, hearty pies and... Well, you had a meal of mussels at one point that were oh, just phenomenal. Those mussels. I still dream about those mussels. It was a fantastic experience food-wise. And, of course, it, when you're eating at a lot of these restaurants, they'll have the bands that are playing what they call right. trod music, uh, which is that, you know, the, the, the whiskey in the barrel type... Whiskey types, in the jar. Whiskey in the jar. This is me. I'm, I'm English and German heritage, Irish Portuguese heritage. I'm showing it my shows. ignorance here. So, so it, was, it was delightful to see... Uh, you know, her light up because, you know, this is where she, she came from and all that. I felt like my soul came home when that plane touched down in Ireland. Now, one of the favorite places to see in Ireland, besides Dublin, is the Cliffs of Moher. Right. And so we really were between Cliffs of Moher and Blarney Castle because there were tours that went both places. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's just a personal preference. Do you want to see these fantastic cliffs? very famous places, or do you want to go maybe to uh, the, the other side, the other direction, southern Ireland, to see the Blarney Castle, to kiss the Blarney Stone, and we would end up going through Cork on this tour. We didn't really have time to do both. I would recommend doing both. If we ever go back to Ireland, we are going to do the Cliffs of Moher. But that said, we did have to choose. It was a great tour, though, because we were going to meet on a bus. We met at the the statue of uh, of statue of Molly Malone, which, by the way, the statue of Molly Malone is very well endowed, and her breasts are very polished. Yeah, it's a bronze statue, so she's got exceptional. Everyone makes sure to polish Molly Malone's uh, bosoms. bosoms 
uh, which are very shiny and very uh, inviting. Uh, so we meet at the statue of Molly Malone. We get on the, this bus, and our bus driver is just a delightful guy who's telling us all these stories. Actually sings to us Molly Malone. Was singing Molly Malone as we're leaving Dublin. What a delight. And, but what also what was interesting is we passed by a lot of camps and people with RVs and whatnot, and he kept on talking about them being travelers. And it was the, really the only time we felt a little bit of insensitivity because there is a group of people, there was a uglier term that they used to be called, but they're now called travelers. You know, with what we're talking about, we're not saying the word. Right. So these travelers have, you know, I guess everybody's got some sort of uh, minority group that, 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 that is faced oppression and is, is, is dealing with... Uh, this is Ireland. Right. Yeah, really, this, Europe. So. Yeah, there's a lot of these. And, and, and I guess different places in Europe have different terms for them. In Ireland, they call them travelers. And it seems like the state is trying to take care of them. Right. But these are very independent people who don't necessarily want to be taken care of. So it's a complicated matter. But you something you don't really see until you get out of Dublin. Right. And so we, we, we learned from this from this gentleman, and it's, it's, it's interesting to see... Uh, how it's evolving and how it's changing. So we take this bus ride and we get to the Blarney Castle, which is this huge, enormous tower. We learn right. about it. Very stark. Right. So one of the things that we had happen at the Blarney Castle is we discovered that Jessica is deathly afraid of heights. Well, we didn't discover. We knew that I was <laughs> deathly afraid of heights. I discovered how primal it can be. So something you might need to know. The Blarney Stone is at the very top of this extremely tall tower, very old tower. Now, me, not necessarily being afraid of heights, especially if I have a nice stone railing to hold on to, I'm hopping around, I'm having fun up there, and she's deathly like, get down, you stop. You jumped on a murder hole. Yeah, well, there, there were bars over it, so it was perfectly safe. So the Blarney Stone is actually on the other side of a murder hole. And you have to lean down and suspend your body halfway over the open air. Well, there's a bar underneath you, but how it works is there's a nice little pad you sit on, and a gentleman sits on your legs to keep you supported. You lean upside down, and you kiss the Blarney Stone upside down. Now, this is a very uncomfortable position, but people line up for hours to do it, and of course, we did. And so we decided that we wanted to take pictures as we're doing it. So she went first, mm -hmm. and I took her picture. Absolutely no problem. I, I hand her the <laughs> I hand her the camera. My hands are doing this, and I don't realize that her hands are shaking so much she can't get my picture. This was our first big fight in Europe. And fights when you're traveling as a couple do happen. You must expect these fights to happen. And in fact, we had a massive one we're going to come to later in the series. Right. So we're not going to hide the fact that yes, we're on vacation. Yes, we're loving every second of it. But traveling, especially when you are with this one person for so long, it gets stressful. I love this man. I got tired of this man. <laughs> we fought. You have to know that's going to happen. You right. can't pretend. So don't be shocked when it happens because it will happen. And in fact, we discussed it before we ever left that there will come a time when we will be standing in the middle of the street shouting at each other and yet we are going to walk away knowing, because we're walking in knowing, that we are on the same side and we each want each other's happiness and this is just travel stress. Yeah, tra st travel is stressful, but it's so worth it. Absolutely. And, and you learn uh, each from each other. Now, the reason I wanted her to take the photo and why I was so upset is because I really wanted a photo and of me kissing the stuff. they're not cheap if you buy them. They will charge you for it and they're not cheap, but... We ended up making up, and, and we, we got our we picture taken. Photos. We bought the photos. So the other reason is I didn't want to carry around this big photo uh, in a pamphlet for the entire 90 days we were Luckily, there, and we still had a lot of time there. Because we did, were there for 90 days. I had a folder with all the printouts of our reservations and our tickets and our flights and trains and all of this. So I was able to put these in that folder and keep them nice and flat. Right. Organization is key when you're taking a long trip like this. So the last part of our journey is we go through the city of Cork, which is a much smaller town than Dublin, but still interesting and worthwhile. It's got this big river that goes through it. Uh, it's got some great shopping that you can go through. And one of the things we did, because we didn't have a lot of time, is we went to a brewery. And because uh, we love going to breweries. Of course. We went to this place called Rising Suns. 
brewery, and we thought, oh, Irish brewery. It was not Irish. It wasn't Irish. It was an American theme. They even had NASCAR hoods hanging on the yeah, walls. several of them. They had pizza. They made IPAs. Not good pizza. And, and yeah, it wasn't, I mean, no offense. No offense. Ireland does what Ireland does incredibly well. You make well. great Guinness. You make great all this other beer. Why do you have to muddy the waters with an American style IPA? Like, I like an American style IPA, but it's it's sort of like, it's almost like the Europeans make fun of us for making beer because we're making bad lagers and bad porters and whatnot. It's it's kind of the reverse. It's like, what are you guys doing? We make IPAs and muddy now, things now. with grapefruit the because British, we're not good at that. The British originated the IPA. Granted, but we, you know, so so it's it's you know the craft beer scene in the United States copied in in other European places. It didn't necessarily work, but okay, it was it was worth going to and it was worth checking out. So we go back to Dublin, take a nice nap, being serenaded by our bus driver, and we end up going to just more places at all Dubliner. We went Temple to Temple Bar, m Temple, more places at Temple Bar. We got more great food, and you could just never get tired of the place. The, oh, it's such a walkable, meanderable city. Right, the, just the the music, the food, the, the scene. You have this image of what Ireland is, and, what and it's it supposed isn't to... wrong. Yeah, it's it's actually. The only cliche that is correct, but in a delightful way. Right. It's, 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 it's everything, Ireland and Dublin is everything you want it to be, and that's not a bad thing. The it's, people are lovely, the culture is lovely, the food is to die for. And so it's an unavoidable trip if you're an American, if you have Irish heritage. And because it was the furthest point uh, west, closest to the states where, where we were going, I mean, I suppose we could have started with Iceland, but we chose to start with Dublin. Right. It was the obvious starting point to what became an unforgettable... It was an unforgettable starting point right. to what became an unforgettable journey. Oh, absolutely. And we can't wait to tell you more about this story as the series progresses. So stay tuned. So this has been Passports and Birth Control. Don't forget your passport. Don't forget your birth control. Now today we're making a variation on a typical Irish drink. Your typical drink is a Jameson and ginger, Jameson whiskey, ginger beer, not ginger ale. Ginger ale is made with ginger flavoring, ginger beer is made with actual ginger. Now, for a Jameson and ginger, it's one part to one part. We're making a, an Irish mule. So, you're going to take your Jameson, and you're going to do one ounce of Jameson, and that goes into a mule glass. Now you can use whatever ginger beer you like. We like Gosling's. That's typically used in dark and stormy. It's a very good, very ginger forward ginger beer. And you're just going to top your whiskey with that, nice and fizzy. Now what makes this different from a Jameson and ginger is the squeeze of lime. So you're going to squeeze your lime wedge in there. And that is your Jameson and ginger. Now again, because the baby, I can't this off to David. That's an Irish mule.